Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Doylestown, PA. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. We meet every Saturday night at 8.30 p.m. at 301 North Main Street, Doylestown, PA, 18901. It's an open meeting. All are welcome. Tonight's speaker is Bill B. from Connecticut, author and producer of the movie My Name is Bill W., uh, a number of awesome books, 1,000 Years of Sobriety, and much more. He's very awesome. Please enjoy, and see you next Saturday. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Like I was expecting it. So, uh, um, my name is Bill and I am an alcoholic, and I am a recovered alcoholic, um, and uh, I'm sober tonight through the grace of God, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and a lot of people like yourselves who have taught me how to stay away from one drink one day at a time, and for that I'll be forever grateful. And my sobriety date is April 8th of 1962. And uh, I got sober when I was 10. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I want to thank Ron for inviting me to this wonderful party that you guys have every Saturday night. Uh, as a matter of fact, that if you're in AA, we have a party every night. And um, I'd like to thank my friend Paul. Stand up, Paul. That's my friend Paul. He drove us down tonight. And, um, he drove my friend Brian and my friend Robin and myself down. We had a great meeting coming down. And we'll have another great meeting going home. If we all stay awake going home. <laughs> But I can't tell you how delighted I am to be here tonight. I'm delighted to be in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm delighted to be in an AA meeting anywhere, anytime, anyplace. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. It not only gave me back a life that I never thought I could have, it gave me everything that anybody would ever want in this, in this life. And, uh, so, and I want to thank Ron also for uh, uh, buying us dinner tonight. Of course, I had a promise that I'd write a movie about him if I did that, so. <laughs> My name is Ron. <laughs> so, sounds pretty good, doesn't it sound good? <laughs> anyway, anyway, I, uh, what I love about Ron is, and, and, and uh, is he just loves Alcoholics Anonymous, and he's so happy about it, he's laughing all the time. And that's, that's what I find in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, it's, a, it's, the, it's the joy of sobriety that comes out in the kind of special laughter that we all have. And if you're not laughing tonight, talk to your sponsor because there's something wrong. If we're not smiling and happy in Alcoholics Anonymous, well, we might as well join something else, whatever the heck that can be. I don't know about you, but when I came here, I was so, so uptight about myself that my sponsor said to me that, um, you know, um, I had a, um, uh, I was so, I had crawled so far up my rear end, I needed a porthole in my stomach to look out, you know. I thought that was very visual. <laughs> Either end you want to look at. Anyway, um, so anyway, I am, I am really delighted to be here. I want to start by sharing with you uh, a, a little story which you probably all heard, but well, I'm going to tell it anyway, because so, <laughs> I like telling it. I'm still very selfish in that respect. And it's about these two fellas, Mike and Pat. They met in a bar one afternoon, and uh, they shook hands, and before you know it, they were fast drinking buddies. And they drank so much that after a while they became alcoholics, and they were alcoholics for a number of years before they got so bad, they decided to join AA. And now they're in AA over 25 or 30 years, and one night they're sharing with each other, and one says to the other, you think when we die, there might be AA in heaven? 
And Pat says, sure, I think so, Mike, but, uh, but I can't be certain. He said, well, I'll tell you what, whoever dies first, let's promise that we'll come back and tell the other one whether there's AA in heaven or not. So they make a pact. Well, Mike dies first. And one night, Pat's laying in bed, and poof, Mike shows up. He says, Mike, he said, well, I told you, I made you the promise. I... He says, well, tell me, is there AA in heaven? He says, well, I have good news, and I have bad news. What do you want to hear first? He says, well, give me the good news first. He says, all right. He says, there definitely is AA in heaven, and it's fabulous. It is absolutely fabulous. They have these big open meetings every day. People from all over the world come and tell their stories, kings and queens and rich and poor, and it's just wonderful. He said, well, then what's the bad news? He said, you're speaking tomorrow night. <laughs> the problem with that story is becoming more and more relevant to me, you know. <laughs> but there's got to be AA in heaven, yeah, because it's, this is... And there's also AA in, on earth, because if we're in AA, we're in heaven. How else can you describe this Un incredible program? That if we really work it, if we really work it, just as hard as we work at drinking, you know? That's what my sponsor said. He said, if you put 10% of the effort into AA that you put in drinking, you can have a great sober life. But if you put in more than that, you can have an incredible life. And if you put in more than that, I don't know how much I've put in. But I can tell you that, and, and I'm sure there are some young people, new people, coming back people in here tonight that aren't going to believe a word I say. Of course, I didn't believe it when my sponsor told it to me. But he said I could have a, a life beyond my wildest dreams. Well, I'm going to share my story with you tonight. And if my life is not beyond my wildest dreams or your wild, I mean, I don't know what. I don't know how to describe a guy who comes from a literally pathetic, devastated, alcoholic home who was filled with hate, resentment at the age of eight, nine years old, just didn't know what to do, just couldn't get out of the prison that he was in, and then winds up with the gifts that God has given him to do some of the things that God has enabled me to do. Um, we are all miracles sitting here tonight, and some people say that, Bill, you use that word too loosely. How can you describe our lives? If we're only one day sober, it's a miracle. I mean, it is, because I don't know about you, but I could not stop drinking. I, could, I couldn't get my, my rear end off the bar stool in Monaghan's saloon. I thought I had sat in crazy glue or something. It just, you know, I just couldn't get off the stool. And I couldn't explain to myself, and I sure couldn't explain to anybody else why. I had no idea about this powerlessness over alcohol. But I'm going to share what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. And, uh, and I'm probably going to wind up laughing at some of the most serious, <laughs> serious things that happened to me. And I got back at a buddy of mine who was driving along the Pennsylvania Turnpike in, in a Volkswagen. And he skidded on some r black ice and, and he rolled down a hill, turned over 18 times in his Volkswagen. And got to the hospital and he was bragging about how if he weren't, if he weren't drunk he would have probably been killed. That being drunk loosened him up, you know. And the doctor said, if you weren't drunk, you wouldn't roll down the hill 18 times. <laughs> but we give out, didn't we, didn't we give alcohol credit for so much in our lives? I mean, I gave it credit for everything in my life. You know, meeting girls, being able to meet girls, being able to go out on dates, being able to dance, being able to do, be it. You know, I gave out right to the bitter end. I gave alcohol credit for just enabling me to put up with life. And that's how bad it got. Anyway, um, as I say, I came from this house, and, you know, and I, and I wanted to get out. I, I had a terrible uh, anger and resentment and hatred toward my father, who was a terrible alcoholic. And, um, and by the way, uh, who wound up getting sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. Isn't that fantastic? And we became, I finally found a father in Alcoholics Anonymous. Never had one growing up. Never had one as a kid or as a teenager. Never had anybody I could go to for advice when I needed it as I was a young man. Nothing that, but I found a father in Alcoholics Anonymous and we became close, close, close friends. And he stayed sober 15 more years and, uh, and I still miss him to this day, a man I hated. A man I swore I'd never be like and I wound up worse then, you know. 
little do we know. So, uh, what's that expression? Be kind to the people on the way up, you're going to beat them on the way down. <laughs> and it's so true. Anyway, so I grew up in this house and I, and I wanted to get out. And I don't know if that was the total reason why I went away to a seminary, but I went away to a seminary when I was 13 to study to become a Maryknoll missionary priest. I generally get a laugh at that. But, um, thank you. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and I think that was part of it. I wanted to get out of the house so badly. And, uh, but, I, but I enjoyed being in a seminary for about four years because they had uh, baseball and football and basketball and hockey and all that kind of stuff. And, and I didn't mind the studies. I, I, I've always loved. I've always loved reading. I've been. I have a reader all my life, and, and so I loved the work. And I loved working on the farm. And it was. It was in uh, just just north of Scranton, Pennsylvania, in a town called Clark's Green, Pennsylvania. And uh, I stayed there four years, and then I left. Actually, I didn't leave. I had a spiritual director who had been watching me very closely, and apparently. He had been seeing my character defects and shortcomings long before I did. <laughs> because of my senior year, he called me in and he said, William, he said, I think maybe one of these days you might make a wonderful father. But not in here, he said. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I left and I came out into the world. You know, in, in the seminary they call us the world because this is where all the pretty girls are, you know. And having been away for four years from the neighborhood and the, and the pretty girls, I was kind of, you know, uh, you know, like, uh, what do they say, a frog and a fish out of water? And, uh, but after a while, uh, it, it got better. And, um, and uh, I got a job. I started going to St. John's University to finish up my, uh, my uh, academics. I got a job with a newspaper in New York as a copy boy. It was the old New York Journal American, which most people don't remember. But this is 1951, and there were 18 newspapers in the city of New York. It was the heyday of journalism. Famous columnists, famous writers, very little TV, radio news, little, but mainly newspapers. Everybody bought the morning paper and the, and the evening paper every day. That's what they read. They read the papers. And I came copy boy, and, um, I, and then I broke a big story, accidentally. And uh, I'll just, just briefly tell you that, that uh, there was a scandal in New York. The mayor and the fire chief had a scandal going. They were shaking down building contractors who needed permits to build and charging them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, they sort of made making billions. And the FBI investigated, and the mayor left. He, he, he fled New York, and they got a hold of the fire commissioner, and they arrested him, 99 counts of grand larceny or something. And uh, one night in my ethics class at St. John's University, I happened to notice this elderly guy in the back of the class who looked familiar. Well, the reason he looked familiar was because his face was on every paid paper in, the, in, the, in New York. And I said to myself, what a story. Here's a fire commissioner charged with 99 counts of stealing, and he's studying ethics at St. John's University. <laughs> The next day I told my city editor, and he literally stopped the press, and it was a front page story, and that afternoon he made me a newspaper reporter. I was just turning 19 years old, wet behind the ears, scared to death, and said to him, well, what do I do? I didn't want to act too stupid. And he said, well, go over to Brooklyn, New York. You're going to be a, 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 a night side police reporter. And he said, you'll find a bunch of other reporters over there. Just ask them what they do, and you do the same thing, but try to do it better. I said, okay. So I went over to New York, over to Brooklyn, and uh, where I was born, by the way, I still have that touch, don't I? Thank you. I don't want to lose my Brooklyn accent. And um, so I asked the lieutenant on a desk where I could find some of the other reporters, and he pointed across Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn to the Edison Bar and Grill. And he said, you'll find some of them in the Edison Bar and Grill. He was wrong. I found all the reporters in the Edison Bar and Grill. <laughs> I thought that was their office. And, uh, so I asked the bartender if I could introduce me to a reporter. He introduced me to a guy named Charlie Feeney. Never forget, Charlie Feeney of the Daily Mirror. Charlie was about 60 some odd years old. I was, I was replacing a guy who was retiring, Johnny Crosby. And, um, and they all knew it because it was a small club. And they all knew that some kid was coming over to replace their buddy, Johnny Crosby. So they're going to have some fun with me. And so Charlie said, what are you drinking? And I said, I'll have a Coke. He said, the hell you will. And he bought me a shot and a beer. I didn't want to drink it. I saw what it did to my father. I saw what it did to my two grandfathers. I saw what it did to my grandmother. I saw it killed three of my father's brothers, alcoholism, 
It was rampant in my family, and I knew where it started. But here I am now, among all these other big shot newspaper reporters, I'm now a big shot newspaper reporter. What do I do? Act like a kid? Act like a child and have a coke? Or just, just down a double shot? So I just, I hadn't seen my father do it many times, so I just held my nose and downed a double shot, chased it with a beer, and, and, and my insides almost came up. But uh, <clears throat> then he introduced me to Joey George of the Daily Mirror, of the Daily News, and Joey says, what are you drinking, kid? And I says, now can I have a Coke? He says, hell no, bought me a shot and a beer. Told me what he did. I got a lot of advice from these guys, though, and uh, then he introduced me to Johnny Michaels of the New York Times, shot and a beer. And they passed me down the bar. You know. And by the time I got halfway down the bar, I don't know about you guys and gals, but something began to happen to me. <laughs> I began to feel good. I was no longer scared to death. I was no longer uptight, you know? And I'm not, I don't mean melodramatic about this, but this is what happened to me. I began to relax. I began to feel like I always wanted to feel, but I had never felt before because I was always uptight, I was always anxious, I was always afraid. And tonight I wasn't, that night I wasn't. By the time I walked out of the Edison Bar Grill, and I did manage to walk out of the Edison Bar Grill, <laughs> I felt like a veteran newsman, you know, and that's what booze did to me. That was my first drinks of alcohol. And you know what I was the next night? Back in the Edison Bar and Grill, getting ready to work again. And that's what I began to do, because I felt like Right almost from the beginning, I was a much better reporter with a few drinks. And, um, and, I, and I wanted to feel the way I felt. I didn't drink excessively in the beginning, but I drank practically every night, and on weekends I would occasionally get drunk. Because this is a progressive disease, as we know. With some of us it attacks us faster, and with some of us it doesn't. With my father, you know, he didn't find this program until he was 56 years old. And, um, and I, I, I got sober when I was 28, half his age. Um, but uh, but it, it began to build up on me. And, uh, but that's, I began to use alcohol because um, before I would do anything, uh, as I used to say, I used to get ready by having a few drinks. If I was going to a dance, you know, even if they had booze at the dance, I'd have a few drinks, you know, so I'd be in good shape for the dance. If I was going to go ask a girl for a date, I'd have a few drinks before I'd call her up. And then when, if she said yes, I'd have a few drinks to take her on a date. I used alcohol, and without realizing it, without having any, any idea, of course, I didn't know anything about alcoholism. But uh, this just became part of my life. In fact, it became the most important part of my life without my knowing it, you know. And then it began to take its effects, you know, and it does a little bit at a time. With, with most of us, it just is, it creeps up on us, and it crept up on me. And I began to have little accidents, you know, with, with my, I got a car. And the first accident I had is I ran into a telephone pole. Not, not, I wasn't going too fast, because the girl that was on my lap behind the steering wheel was kind of nervous as I was teaching her how to drive. Um, but, uh, so I didn't want to hit the pole too hard. And, uh, and so those are the kind of crazy things I used to do. But then I had a really bad one. Um, I got a call at Monaghan's Bar and Grill. One of my I used to drink in six different joints, and the and the operator at the city desk in the, in the, in Manhattan had my had six phone numbers for bars and one for my home. And uh, so they reached me at Monaghan's and they told me that the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard was on fire, big roaring fire at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Ships were burning and exploding and. They told me to get down there right away. So I got a container full of scotch and soda, put it with me in the car, and I headed for the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And I was driving under an elevated train um, because it's, it, was, it was raining out. I wanted to stay, you know, to go fast. So anyway, to make a long story short, I forgot that the elevated train went, at Bedford Avenue went back down underground and became a subway. And I just kept going straight ahead. <laughs> By the time I saw that red blinking light, and the big stone block saying stop, boom, 80 miles an hour. And that steering wheel busted on my chest. I fell out of the car, lost part of my tongue, part of my teeth, uh, six broken ribs, two of them were sticking out of my chest, and came to at the at Jewish hospital, which was a familiar place because I used to go to Jewish hospital to cover murders and rapes and stuff like that as a reporter. 
And, um, and they put me back together again, and, uh, and after a number of weeks, sent me home to recuperate with my mom and dad. That's where alcoholics generally go to recuperate with mommy, right? Anyway, um, and one Saturday afternoon, uh, a bunch of my friends came to visit me at the house. Alcoholics love to visit the sick and bury the dead because there's usually a bottle around, you know? And uh, so my father was passing the bottle, but when he came to me, he grabbed it and he says, you shouldn't have any hard stuff with that. I had a wired up jaw, I had a fractured jaw. My jaw is all wired up. And, uh, but he said, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I got something that can soothe the pain. And he gave me a bottle of Christian Brothers Sherry Wine. I don't know if you ever drank Christian Brothers Sherry Wine, but it's very sweet. And if you sip enough of that to a wired up jaw, you know, you can get pretty drunk. And you can get pretty, and you can get pretty sick. And have you ever tried to puke through a wired up jaw? Ooh. From personal experience, the big pieces come out of your ears, you know? you know. So I swore off Christian Brothers Sherry Wine. What else are you going to do, right? So, and I can, and I can tell you that. And and um, and I got married. I, I was engaged a few times. Um, in fact, my second engagement, I didn't even know I was engaged until I got a call from the girl. I was supposed to meet her somewhere, and, um, and I, my, my, my mother knew it before I did, so uh, I, all I remember is meeting her. My brother was a friend of mine, and all I remember is what he said to me one night, would you like to meet my sister? Next thing I know, I'm engaged to his sister. Because I'd become a blackout drinker. You know, I was sharing with Paul and the guys coming down in the car, on the car, I mean, I'd walk into Monaghan Sunday afternoon and the owner would be screaming at me to get the heck out because of what I did Saturday night, which I didn't remember. I didn't remember showing, throwing Jimmy Steen into the world which a, you know, record player, so. Uh, I was a, became a blackout drinker. And um, anyway, uh, I met this lovely girl. Oh, she was a lovely girl. And uh, named Bernadette. And um, she had studied, I had studied to be a priest, she had studied to be a nun. So I wound up on getting into her habit and the whole thing was all over, you know, so. Uh, and uh, we eloped to Elkton, Maryland down the road here and, uh, and uh, we knew each other three and a half weeks. Three and a half weeks. You know? And in March we were married 60 years. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That's alcoholic. <laughs> That's a combination of Alcoholics Anonymous and her not being too bright. Anyway, it's a, <laughs> don't tell her I said that, by the way, because it's the opposite. Anyway, um, what a fantastic lady she is. You love her to death. I wish you were with me tonight. She, she had other things to do. But anyway, um, she came from a family, by the way, of, of uh, um, 16 children. 16 children. Only when I married her, there were only 12 left. And, uh, and only had one boy. His name was Anthony. Great guy and a really funny guy, you know. And I remember asking him one night, what was it like growing up with 12 sisters? And he said, you know, Bill, I didn't know until I was 13 I didn't have to sit down to pee. You know, so uh, <laughs> he was, uh, it was an interesting family. But, uh, <laughs> And I became, I became quickly known in the family as Doozy Potts. That means you're nuts. So, uh, and uh, Bernadette had no idea what she was getting herself into. She had no idea about drinking, you know. They had wine at Sunday dinner, you know, that's what they did. And, and then, do you have a glass of wine? And they'd pour me a glass of wine. And I would drink my glass of wine as they were sipping theirs. And I'm waiting for the bottle to come back. <laughs> and I'm saying, what a bunch of cheap SOPs these people are, you know. I mean, they had no idea. And, um, but anyway, this is wonderful girl who put up with an awful lot. She had no idea she had just bought herself a fast ticket to hell with, alcoholic hell with me. And, uh, and why she put up with, why, why wives of alcoholics put up what they do? And even today, I just, it's really amazing. Really, Dr. Bob used to say that, you know, Dr. Bob said to Bill one day, why our wives put up with us all these years, I'll never know. And, um, but uh, sobriety has brought Bernadette and I, again, a life beyond our wildest dreams. And uh, we had, um, we quickly, very, very quickly had four children. 
and um, and uh, we, uh, we we rented a, a nice apartment and then we were able to buy a house um, two family house which was easy to take care of because we got rent upstairs um, but then after a while I was having difficulty paying the mortgage because of my drinking so we sold the house and moved out to Long Island New York bought a one family house and that we kept that for about 12 months until the bank took it away for non-payment and Bernard didn't know anything about it because I was a pretty good liar and I lied all the time in fact I lied I, I learned to lie when I was a kid you know just to get away with stuff or put up with stuff or, and, and, uh, and anyway um, so uh, it, I'll just share very quickly with you uh, how alcoholism began to affect every aspect of my life because that's what this, this disease does. It affects every aspect of our lives. It doesn't leave any stone unturned. Not in my life, and I'm sure not in yours either. And um, on a job, for example, um, God had blessed me with some talent to, to write and report. And, uh, and I had a city editor that liked me. And so I moved ahead pretty quickly. And by the time I was, I, I covered, I went from covering police headquarters to covering civil court, civil criminal courts. And then I did a one-year stint covering City Hall, and then he brought me in on nightside rewrite because I learned I could, found out I could write. And then I went on dayside rewrite, where you're writing in the running stories of the day. And, and then when I was 22, I was promoted to a fi feature writer for the largest evening newspaper in the world. Now I say that because that's a fact. I was given that opportunity to be a police report, to be a byline writer for the largest paper. And and uh, and by the time I was 25. I drank all that up, I got fired five times, and I was now the obituary editor for the largest <laughs> newspaper in the world. <laughs> and there's a big difference between those two jobs, by the way. You know, be, as a byline writer, you travel all over the country. I mean, I, I went down to Alabama and watched George Wallace slam the doors against the black students and wouldn't allow them in. You know, the first Sputnik shot up into space and last execution at Sing Sing Penitentiary. There's a lot of great stories I covered. At the, as the obituary editor, my job was to call up funeral homes after 3 o'clock in the morning and find out what well-known people dropped dead that night and then write their obituary editor. Well, by this time, and I was now, what was I, 25 years old? I was too busy because I now my, my disease had really crept up on me to the point where I was not only a daily drinker, I was a daily drunk. In fact, when I wrote at the rewrite battery, as rewrite man I had a and most of us did we had a half a pint of booze in my drawer and and about six caught six packs of cigarettes and uh, I was a four day four pack a day smoker and uh, so smoke and drink smoke and drink smoke and drink but by this time it was so I was so into the booze that I was spending most of my time at Moochie Saloon which was across the street from the newspaper which was on the East River and Santa Market Strip and um, and so instead of calling up funeral directors and finding out who, who died that night, I would tear them out of other newspapers, paste them on a piece of paper. This is before computer type, and I would send them into the composing room. And now we were printing obituaries of people who had died a couple of days ago. And I was getting notes in my bail box in the city room from my city editor saying, we want fresh obits. <laughs> and I'm saying, what's a fresh obit? The bum is dead. So... Uh, when we printed one of a guy that died four days ago, I knew I was on my way out for the sixth time and probably final. And so I quit and I got a job working for a weekly magazine. I had a friend of mine on this weekly magazine um, who liked the way I wrote. And um, he, was, he became my boss and I began to now travel again all over the country, interviewing famous people, going to great places and getting drunk everywhere I went and getting into trouble everywhere I went because now I was uncontrollable. I was totally powerless over alcohol. I had no idea. All I knew was I needed to drink. I was filled with fears because I, I, I was making enough money, but I was spending twice as much as I was making, so I began to pile up debts. I began with beneficial finance company and a household finance company, local loan company. And then I began to borrow from the banks. And, and by the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I had $67,000, and that was a lot of money back then, and it still is a lot of money today. In fact, I owed 17000 to loan sharks, and they don't like to wait, you know, and their vigorish is pretty strong. And uh, so I lasted on this magazine job almost three years until I, um, I was out in Las Vegas to cover a B convention, and I got drunk. And I was drunk for three days, 
My deadline was coming up that afternoon at 2.30. And so I staggered out of bed at noontime, and all the people that I was supposed to interview were all gone. So I sat at the bar and I started drinking, and there was a guy sitting next to me who told me he had been at the convention, and he had known all these people, and he had known how they thought, and what they said, and so forth. So I interviewed this guy. <laughs> but I had a press kit with some of the speeches in them, you know? So between what this guy thought he remembered, and what this press kit said, and my fertile imagination, I wrote a hell of a story. As a matter of fact, I called it in, and they called me back an hour later, and told me it was one of my finest pieces, except it was as phony as a $4 bill. And they found out when two of those people I quoted in the story said that they had never met me before. And uh, so they fired me. Anyway, um, I got a job then working for a radio station in New York, WOR Radio, running radio shows. And that lasted six months because, you know, you got to be meet deadlines. And uh, I wasn't meeting deadlines. And then I finally wound up with a small job in a small PR firm. And that lasted me about four months. And they fired me. So now I'm 27 years old. Got four children. We're no longer living in that house that the bank took away. We're now living in my mother-in-law's basement. The children are sleeping around the walls in broken cribs, and my wife and I are sleeping on two cots behind the oil burner. I hated the basement. I hated it. Because every time I started down there, it just made me face myself, and I knew what I was doing, and I hated myself for it, but I didn't know what to do about it. The other thing I used to do is, I would, to get to the basement, I had to walk through the side door of the house, and if you went up three stairs, you were in the dining room. If you turned and went down, you went down to the basement. But if you went up three stairs, my mother-in-law was always sitting at the dining room table. And she was always praying. And I hated her, because I knew she was praying for me. And I thought, who the heck does she think she is praying for me? I don't need anybody praying for me. When I say praying, I mean she had two stacks of prayer cards. The New Testament, the Old Testament, the lives of the saints, and two sets of rosary beads. Now that's a prayer. That's a prayer. And sometimes I'd be so drunk, I'd stand there and I'd start screaming and hollering at her. Stay out of my life. I don't need you in my damn life. And she would just keep on praying and never said a word. He was a lady who saw what this drunken bum was doing to her daughter and her grandchildren and never said a word to me. But when Bernadette finally had enough and wanted to leave me, my mother-in-law said to her daughter, you can't leave him now, he's a very sick man. Wait till he gets well, better. She knew there was something wrong with me, and she told me sometime later on that she knew that nobody can do this, you know, unless they were very, very sick. It was the first week of March of 1961 when I never told my wife where I was going, except this one particular afternoon, I was supposed to meet somebody in New York, and I was trying to borrow some money, and I was lying to him about some project that I had. So Bernie knew where I was, and our daughter, our youngest daughter, our oldest daughter, Judy, she was then five, I believe, she got a kidney infection, had to be rushed to the hospital, and so Bernie had called me and, and uh, asked me if I'd meet her at the hospital. And when I showed up, I fell out of the cab. I was so drunk. And she started crying hysterically, and she begged me not to go into the hospital. And uh, she hadn't eaten all day. And as much as she didn't want to be with me, um, there was nothing else to do. So we wound up at this Chinese restaurant, and she said I ordered eight drinks, which was probably true because I no longer ordered one at a time because bartenders are too slow. You know, by the time you finish your drink, he's serving somebody else, you know. So, uh, but eight, I had, I didn't. But I believe that I don't recall all of this story. She told me that she looked at me, and, uh, and this part, part of it I remember, and she asked me again the same question she had asked me many times before. She said, why? Why? How many times have we been asked by the people who love us the most, why? Why are you doing this? Why? Is this something I did? You know? And I broke apart that particular afternoon, and, um, and I reached out to her and I said, there's something wrong with me. I think I'm going crazy. Because there had been a few weeks before that a couple of incidents where I'd come to in bars, not knowing how I got there, not remembering where I was before, not having much money in my pocket, so I was filled with fear. 
And so I considered, I thought I was going crazy because I said only crazy people do this stuff. And I told her that, I thought I was going crazy. Well, you don't share those things with my wife because she's not a woman who just listens. She's a woman who takes action. She believed that this, if there's something wrong, you do something about it, you know. My answer was, yeah, yeah, I drink. <laughs> Instead, she called our family doctor and told a little white lie. And she said, I have a brother-in-law, uh, my sister's husband, and he's got a problem. Um, do you think you could help him out? He thinks he's going crazy. And our family doctor said, what's that bum of a husband done now? And so he recommended I see a psychiatrist. Following Saturday afternoon, I'm sitting in front of Dr. John Broncato. And I'm waiting to lay down on his couch. And he didn't have a couch. So I thought, maybe he's not a real psychiatrist. You know, in the movies, you lay on the couch, right? And you tell the psychiatrist how your father beat you and all that stuff. No couch. Instead, he sits me in front of his desk in this chair. By this time, I weighed about 315 pounds. I, I was sharing with Paul about the days on 45th Street, most of the boys used to, used to call me the moon. So I was so big and round, I'd walk in, they'd say, hey, look, the moon is out tonight, you know. <laughs> And, and I'd laugh because um, I wanted him to serve me. I was willing to humiliate myself that much just to drink. And how many of us have done stuff like that? I've humiliated myself many times just to have another drink. And that's what I used to do. And so I was really big and round, so I sat in his chair. I laid my belly on the doctor's desk. And he looked down at me, and uh, he had a little pencil mustache and half glasses. And he said to me, what's your name? I said, Bill. <laughs> he said, what are you doing here? I said, I think I'm going crazy. He said, why do you think you're going crazy? Tell me. And I began to tell him some of the things that were happening to me, you know? And then, you know, it was all, they were all involved with booze. And then he stopped me and he said, you drink a lot, don't you? I said, well, what do you mean by a lot? He said, you tell me. I said, all right. He said, well, let me ask you, you have, drink with the bo have beers with the boys on weekends? I said, yeah, I do. He said, you ever drink beer on Mondays or Tuesdays? I said, yeah. You ever drink beer on Wednesdays, Thursdays, or Fridays? I said, yeah. Did you ever drink anything else aside from booze? You ever drink any rye? I said, yeah. You ever drink any scotch? I said, yeah, I like scotch. Did you ever drink any bourbon? Yeah, I like bourbon and water. That's a good drink. How about gin? Yeah, gin and tonic in the summer. That's, that's good. Vodka? Yeah, vodka's good. Yeah. He said, wine? I said, well, I don't drink any Christian brother's sherry wine. I, 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 gave, I gave that up. And, uh, what he was trying to do was to paint a picture of a guy who drank every day in the week and didn't get his hands on. And then he asked me that magic question. He says, do you know what an alcoholic is? I straightened up. I, of course, I knew the answer to this one. I said, yes, I do. And I described the guy on a Bowery sitting on a curb, picking lint out of his navel, right? That's a, that's a power, that's an alcoholic. That's all I knew, an alcoholic. He said, Bill, that's an alcoholic in the final stages of his disease. He said, he wasn't born there in a power. He was born in a nice place like you, maybe even nicer. And through the use and abuse of alcohol, he wound up on the Bowery. And then he began to talk to me about the disease of alcoholism. This guy had been a colonel in the Air Force. He was a medical doctor and a psychiatrist, and he knew all about alcoholism. God brought me to the right guy, but at the wrong time. <laughs> and as he began to talk about the disease, I suddenly got an impression that he was insinuating <laughs> that I was an alcoholic and I wanted to punch him right in the mouth. Because I said to myself, here I come to this bum out of the goodness of mine. And, 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 and here he is sitting there insulting me, you know? So I stopped listening, except when he finished. He said, Bill, if you are an alcoholic, and I think you are, he said. He said, there's nothing I could do for you. And suddenly, I, I, my heart stopped beating. I mean, I needed help. I knew I needed help from somebody, and I thought this might be the guy. He said, but I know some people who can. And he wrote down on a piece of paper, because the, this is before computers, by the way. At least that's before they were in heavy use. This is 1961. <laughs> And uh, he wrote down a phone number of the integral office of AA, and he says, if you really want help, go see these people. They'll help you. But he says, there's no sense in coming back to see me, because it costs, you know, I forget what it was then, 40, 50 bucks a visit. 
And he says, you're going to need that money if you want to drink. You know, so he's a sort of straight guy. He was so honest, I hated his guts. And, uh, <laughs> but how do you go home and tell your wife that a psychiatrist thinks you're an alcoholic? I mean, how humiliating is that? So I stopped off at Fred Funk's saloon, and I had a few double shots, right, to get ready to tell my wife, or at least fabricate what to tell my wife. So when I got home, I sat with her. I sat on my cot, and she sat on her cot behind the oil burner. And I said to her, uh, this psychiatrist thinks I'm an alcoholic. She said, I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I said, don't get upset. I said, uh, he thinks I'm an alcoholic. But you've got to understand what he means by an alcoholic. She said, tell me. He said, alcoholics, he said, and I paraphrase some of this stuff. You know. His alcoholics are usually very intelligent people. <clears throat> and, uh, but he said, they are very, very sensitive people. And see, what happens is when they get upset, they have to reach for a drink. So he told me to tell you to stop yelling at me from now on. Okay? <laughs> and to tell your damn mother to lay off me too. So she kept saying, what else did he say? What else did he say? Now, you're not going to believe this, but this is the God honest truth. I said, he wants me to go to AA. And she looked at me puzzled, and she said, well, how is American Airlines going to help you? you know? <laughs> That's how little, you know, people knew back then about AA. You know? I said, no, 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 not some American. I said, it's got something to do with drinking. Oh, she said, oh, then you're going to go, right? You're going to go. I said, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. So I went over to New York, and I walked into the group office, and there was a guy named John sitting behind a desk. Never will forget John. I met a guy tonight, a big tall guy, that reminded me of John. And uh, John must have, he looked like he was about 6'8", maybe 6'5", 6'6". But I remember he had a brown tweed jacket on, and he had a, remember those old-fashioned wax mustaches, you know? He had one of those things, you know? And he stood up and he stuck out his hand and he said, My name is John, I'm an alcoholic, you got a problem with drinking? I said, no, 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 John, not me, no, no, not me. <laughs> But, but there's a psychiatrist back in Queens that thinks so. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> so stupid. He said, he sent me over here for some information. <laughs> he said, want some information? I said, I want some information, John. I said, here, okay. He said, I'll take you to a meeting tonight, an AA meeting, and you can get all the information you want, okay? I said, well, this is Saturday night, isn't it? He said, yeah, said, what's... I said, well, I'm busy tonight, John. See, that had nothing to do with drink, you know. And he said, okay, then God stepped in. You know, God is always with us, waiting for the crack in our armament, right? So we can squeeze in there and change our lives, you know? Trouble with most of us, like me, I've always kept it so tight in the vest, I've never let him in, you know? And, but he was there again, and now John was about to crack my vest because he said, he took out his wallet, and he handed me his business card. And he said, look, I'll tell you what, anytime you want to go to an AA meeting, call me and I'll take you. I said, all right, gave it a start. I started walking out, I got near the door, and I glanced at his card, and it said, John so-and-so, Vice President, Chase Manhattan Bank. And I was running short, man. And all those debts, I said, I gotta get to know this guy. So I turned right back around and said, John, I think I can make it tonight, John, you know? <laughs> and that's how God got me to my first AA meeting. God works strangely, right? I'm, how did he get you there? He got you there somehow, right? Yeah. So I go to my first AA meeting, and uh, they told me to identify, and it's this little skinny guy, probably soaking wet, he weighed 100 pounds. And here I am, 315, 320. I can't identify with, with that guy. Even when he starts talking about having trouble, you know, drinking and, and wrapping up cars, I had six automobile accidents. And, and uh, getting deeply in debt, having problems with his wife. You know? And I'm saying, hell, that could happen to anybody. You don't have to be an alcoholic. Which simply proves that if you don't want to be an alcoholic, you don't have to be. You simply have to die from this disease, or go to prison, or go to a nut house, go some, you know. And uh, so before I left the meeting, you know how we are with newcomers? We're very mean, we're very mean with newcomers. We grabbed them, right? They grabbed me. Oh, they, and they started, they wanted to give me a meeting list, and they're going to stick that thing any place they can to get me that meeting list. Right? <laughs> and they said, uh, where do you live? I told them where I live. So, oh, your home group meets in such and such a place. And I wasn't going to tell them I was not going to go to an AA meeting in near, my, near where I lived. I didn't want anybody to see me going to AA. Nobody. I never stopped to think that Saturday afternoons they'd see me urinating on their hedges, you know, but to, <laughs> to see me go to AA, my God, you know. I went three miles out of my way to the Woodhaven group, 
stayed around about three months. I was sharing with somebody tonight about I wanted to give it a good chance. I really wanted to stop. I thought if I could stop drinking, the trouble would go away. I had no idea I had to change my entire life. If I could only stop drinking. I almost got there in three months. I almost got there. I didn't quite get there. What I got was looking at all of these guys in this group who were at least 25 or 30 years older than me. I was 27 years older then. And they were in their 60s. And hard drinking guys with bulbous noses and cauliflower ears, stuff like that. And I couldn't, I just, I said, I got plenty of time. And so I left. I came home, told my wife, I'm glad I went because I learned something. She said, what did you learn? I said, I learned that if I ever kept drinking the way I was drinking, someday I could have a lot of trouble. Here I was, unemployable, living in a basement, sleeping on a cot behind an oil burner, with my kids sleeping around the walls in broken cribs. And someday I might have a lot of trouble. That's how sick I was. I could not see reality. All I knew was I needed to have another drink. That's all I needed was another drink and then I'll be all right. I'll think things through. I'll manage somehow. I can handle it. I'll get by, blah, blah, blah. That disease was talking to me like something awful. And that's when, that, when, we, when we listen and hear that stuff from our own minds, that's the disease talking to us. And my sponsor told me I to stop paying attention to it. It took me a while to stop paying attention to it. Make a long story short, a year later, the first week of April of 1962, I woke up in a flea bag hotel, $2 a night, $4 with a sheet on the bed. And um, I was half stuck, my cheek was half stuck in the mattress because I had a growth of beard and I had vomited in my sleep. And uh, so I had to pull myself up, went into the bathroom and uh, looked in the mirror. And my spouse used to tell me, if you want, to, if you want the truth, go look in the mirror. Yeah. Now he tells me if I want to laugh, get all undressed and look in the mirror. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I crawled out on a window ledge and there was a, a window ledge that, that was uh, led to an air shaft. And, you know, they built a building so close in New York, there were air shafts. And as I looked down, I saw all these telephone lines crisscrossing. Paul gets a kick out of this. And I couldn't find a clear spot, you know. <laughs> I was afraid if I jumped, I'd probably hit a wire on the way down and hurt myself. <laughs> now I realize that alcoholics don't want to kill themselves. We just don't know how to live. I just didn't know how to live. But God got me off the window ledge. He sent me home, filled with self-pity, told my wife I was going to leave her for good. She'd be better off without me, all that kind of stuff. And said she looked at me and she says, for God's sakes, Bill, do you owe me one more favor before you go? I said, I guess so. She says, for God's sakes, why don't you give AA another try? I went down the city line to a bar in city line, had two double shots, looked in the mirror again and realized I was at the end. We finally hit that bottom that gets us here. And I came back to the house. She had called somebody that she had met through me the year before. And they were calling back on my mother-in-law's phone and they asked me if I wanted to give AA another try. And that was April 7th of 1962. And April 8th of 1962, my first sponsor, Benny Michelson, a Jewish jeweler from Brooklyn, arrived in front of her house in this big old packet filled with five other guys almost as big as me. And how they managed to squeeze me in that packet <laughs> and hold my fanny off to a meeting, I'll never know, but I got there. And I got great advice going to that meeting. And when I got to that meeting, it was the same meeting I had been at a year before, when I couldn't identify with anybody, and now I was begging them to help me stay sober. And Benny said, I'll tell you what, I'll sponsor you if you do me a favor and do whatever I suggest. But if you don't do my suggest, he says, there's no sense in my sponsoring you. And he became my sponsor. He was my sponsor for the first 31 years of my sobriety. One of the finest men I've ever met. So active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was sharing with Ron earlier that there were two things that, that helped me enormously. One, he loved to go to AA conventions. Wherever he went, I went with him. I was three months old when he took me to Atlantic City to an AA convention, and I walked in and I said to him, there must be something going on here, Benny. He said, yeah, it's an AA convention. I said, you mean all these people are sober? I mean, I couldn't, hundreds of people were there sober. I couldn't believe it. And the second thing, he got me into AA history. I love the history of Alcoholics Anonymous because you can follow God through every line. This is a God-inspired program. And we're all here, whether we want to believe it or not, accept it or not, it doesn't make any difference. Of course, it took me a while, but uh, 
we're here because God loves us that much. And so I began to make progress, but he took me through the 12 steps. As a matter of fact, he took me to a, he's a Jewish jeweler from Brooklyn, he takes me to a Catholic monastery in Jamaica, Queens, to do the fourth and fifth steps. That's how loving he was. He introduced me to a loving God. I never thought there was a loving God. I thought God was only there to get me, you know? That's how important I was. And, uh, but no, no, God loved me, and that's why I was where I was, and that's why I'm where I am now. All right, now, that's what happened, and that's what it was like, and that's what happened, and what is it like now? I became a sober man. I became a man who now, being presented with opportunities, was sober enough to take advantage of them, to do something about them. Because over the years of my drinking, I was presented with many opportunities, many. And I just either drank him away or wasn't sober enough to do anything about it. And I think that's true for most of us, if not all of us. And um, so through the grace of God, I met uh, a couple of fairly wealthy businessmen and, uh, uh, and became friendly with them. And, and um, I had uh, gotten several good jobs, writing jobs, and, and was now out of town. And now I was back in New York and, uh, and in my own business. They put me in my own business, communications business. And, uh, and I stayed very, very active in Alcoholics Anonymous, very active. Um, I still, I may make about four or five meetings a week, sometimes more, but uh, of course I sponsor people and you can't say to somebody, I want you to go to a lot of meetings and then you not go. That's, you know, what, can't 12-step that way. So anyway, this, uh, through, uh, through my business, I met an investment banker who was putting together a company um, and he wanted me to be part of it. And I met the other three guys that were already part of it and there was going to be an independent motion picture production company. And this is back in the early 1970s. And um, so I met the other three guys. They liked me, I liked them, and, and they wanted me on board because I knew story. In other words, I had been a reporter, a writer for magazines, newspapers, radio, so, so I knew story, I knew I made a good story, and, and so I became part of it. It's called Artists Entertainment Complex. And, uh, and, and a uh, investment banker raised some money for us, so we began to make movies. And the first movie we made was with uh, Raquel Welch. Uh, some of the younger people may not know who she was, who she is, but she was a gorgeous thing. If you saw Shawshank Redemption, her picture was on the wall in that prison cell. But we made a movie with Raquel called Kansas City Bomber, where she played a roller derby queen, the old roller derby in New York. And watching Raquel Welch skate around that rink in these black, tight-fitting leather pants was like having a spiritual experience, you know? <laughs> so I, 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 I immediately fell in love with the business. <laughs> <laughs> then we made a movie. Uh, uh, there was a friend of mine, and uh, Peter Moss, he's a great writer. You may have read some of his books. And um, Peter and I had covered the Knapp Commission in New York together. He had been with the Herald Tribune, Tribune when I was with the Journal American. And there was an investigation of dirty cops, and the key witness to all of this was a guy named Frank Serpico, uh, who was a, um, and he turned in a lot of dirty cops. And so they tried to kill him twice. And so he fled to Switzerland, where he spent the next 30 years. And Peter went over to Switzerland and got his rights and would come back and was writing a book. And so we had lunch one day, and I told him about the new company that I was with, and, uh, and we had some good financing, and, um, and uh, so we bought his rights to the book, movie rights, and we made a movie called Serpico with Al Pacino, which put us on the map. And then I came into the office one day, and every other Friday we would have a creative meeting, and I'd sit around, and my three partners would be drinking martinis, and I'd be drinking my Coca-Cola, and... Um, so one of them said, I, I just saw this story in, in Life magazine about this young kid who robbed a bank in Brooklyn to get his lover a sex change operation. What do you think? I said, well, that's not my cup of tea, but it could be a good movie. So I made a movie called Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. And uh, so now we're really on the map. Now, one day I've come home and my wife says to me, you'll never guess who I met today. I said, who's that? She said, I met a lovely lady named Lois Wilson. I said, you're kidding. I said, I had met Bill, I had met Bill several times at his birthday party. Every, every year in New York, they throw a big Bert, William Bill Wilson dinner. 
to raise money for Integroup. And I had met Bill since 1963, and then the last time I met him, excuse me, was in 1969, and he was very sick. In fact, his clothes hung off him, and he uh, has had heart disease and, and emphysema, and, uh, and he was using a puffer. And, uh, but what a charismatic, charismatic man he was. And uh, so I go up to uh, Stepping Stones, and uh, Bernadette introduces me to Lois Wilson. And she takes me upstairs, and if anybody has been to Stepping Stones, you know what a wonderful place it is. And upstairs, there's a big open room which she's turned into an AA, like a museum, with photographs and stories of the early members of AA and the early members of Al-Anon, her desk where she started Al-Anon. It was incredible, incredible. And so I came back downstairs, and the braggart in me started going to work. You know, the braggart and the ego. When you get those two things going for you, man. So I began to tell her what a big shot movie maker I was. And, uh, and that I'd love to make a movie about her and her husband and Alcoholics Anonymous. And she turned to my wife and she said, is she telling me the truth? <laughs> well, she loved my wife Bernadette and they got along. And Bernadette said, yeah, he, yeah he's, he's, he is, you know. So then Lois said to me, why don't we get to know each other first and then let's see what happens. And so uh, we became very close friends. The next 15 years of her life, we were very close, Lois and my wife and I. We became part of each other's family, and uh, and I say that because I, it I, it brings such joy to have been given that kind of a privilege to know someone like that, and uh, who really is more responsible for AA than Bill and Dr. Bob, because without Lois, Bill would have been dead a long time ago, and without Annie, Dr. Bob would have died. They kept these guys alive to start a program that got us all here. You know. And I recognized that right from the start. But anyway, that Lois gave me a, she began to open up and began to share her whole life with me. And I, I wound up with 16 hours of taped interviews and, um, and, wrote, and wrote a script. And um, it took me a number of years to get it made, but finally, I won't go into all of that, but I, I want to, do I have enough time, Ron, to tell this? Huh? Yeah? Okay. I want you to tell you, I, would, I want to show you again how God works. Because you see, what I wanted to do is I wanted to make a big, big movie about Alcoholics Anonymous for the big screen so that my name would be big, 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 see? And then you would know I was picking up from where Bill Wilson left off, you know? And that everybody from now on who had sober would be because of me, you know? That's how crazy this, this thing up here works for me, you know? So I really went, I really went loco almost. And, um, and so I went around in the studios and they would not make the movie because they wanted me to rewrite the script and make it more sexy, make it more, you know. And I had promised Lois that I, you know, I'd just tell the truth of the story and this is a spiritual story. You know, we, we are getting well through a spiritual program. And uh, anyway, so I put it on the shelf and I told Lois, nobody wants to make it right now. So she was disappointed and I was disappointed. But then because of my big ego, my sponsor recognized it very quickly and he said to me, Bill, you're in trouble. He says, you got to come down from that high horse. And he said, I would suggest you start you know, maybe going around and start working with more people because the big book says if you're ever in trouble and you got a problem, the best solution is to work with others. So I had a friend of mine who ran a rehab in the Golden's Bridge in New York named the Casa Serena, a guy named Joe Piccolo, And I used to go up there Friday nights to have spaghetti dinners. He made great spaghetti dinners. So now I was going up there almost every night and, 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 and talking with the drunks. And, and the cook asked me if I'd sponsor him, a guy named Ed, Ed McCormick. And he's passed on now, so I'm not breaking his anonymity. And his first anniversary, he asked me to speak for him, and I did. And then he came to me and he said, Bill, what I decided to do is take your advice. I said, What's, what advice did I give you? <laughs> he said, well, he said, I'm not going to be a cook for the rest of my life at a, at a rehab. So I got to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And sober. I said, good, what did you figure out? He said, I decided I'm going to go to Hollywood and become an actor. And right away I was concerned that maybe my background had influenced him, you know? So I said, if that's your decision, make sure as soon as you get off the plane or train or whatever, head straight for an AA meeting. Get back involved with Alcoholics Anonymous because you're now in an area of rejection. And I know you, you don't like rejection. He said, okay, I'll take your advice. Then he said to me, by the way, he said, let me read the script you wrote. Can I take that with me 
in case they bump into somebody out in Hollywood who wants to make your movie. I said, absolutely, Ed, because that's the way movies get made. A cook from a rehab goes to Hollywood to become an actor. One day he's sitting in his cheesy restaurant and he bumps into a producer and says to the producer, I got this great script under my arm, would you like to make it? And the producer says, I've been waiting for that all my life. I said, that's the way movies get made. Now, I was being a little sarcastic, so I had to apologize, but he said, that's all right, and off he goes. I wasn't, while I was being sarcastic, I didn't believe that there was a chance in heck, you know, that this could happen. But I kept forgetting that God works miracles. So I, I, we're watching television one night, and we're watching the Archie Bunker show, and Archie, Archie Bunker gets robbed. Remember the old Archie Bunker show? And uh, so two detectives arrive. You know who one of the detectives was? My friend Ed. Yeah. A couple of weeks later, we're watching Fred Sanford and Son. You know the uh, junkyard show? Remember that? Yeah. And the junkyard catches fire. And three firemen come running in. You know who the lead fireman was? Ed. My friend Ed. Yeah. He was going around knocking on producers' doors, finding out what they were doing, and getting bit parts. And then he calls me one day, and he's very angry, very upset, and he says, I said, what's the matter, Ed? He says, somebody out here is trying to steal your movie. I said, what are you talking about? He says, the movie that you wrote. I said, well, anybody can make a movie about AA. It's public domain, you know. He says, no, but you had Lois's permission, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to get to the bottom of it. I said, go ahead, Ed, get to the bottom of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> he finds out that there's a company named Garner Show. James Garner, the actor, and his partner, Peter Show. And they have a production company, and they've been trying to make a movie about Alcoholics Anonymous. Because Pete, who's also passed on, was a member of AA. And uh, they went through five writers, and they still haven't gotten a script that they like. So when Ed finds, he, Ed meets um, Mary Ray, Mary Ann Ray, who was James's secretary, and says, I got a script, boom, read it. You know? She takes it home, and she reads my script, and she loves it. She sends it over to James Garner, and he reads it, and he loves it. And he calls his partner and he says, congratulations, Pete. You finally got us a script we can make. He said, what are you talking about? He said, the script I got from this guy, Bill Borchard, back in New York. He said, I never heard of him. He said, never heard of him? And how the hell did I get this script? He said, I don't know. So Pete calls me on the phone and he apologizes and he says to me, I got your script. I read it without your permission. We've been trying to make this movie now for a couple of years. And we've gone through five writers and we got your script. We love it. And he said, uh, but you wrote it as a big feature. Would you be willing to rewrite it as a television movie? I said, I don't know, Pete, I'm kind of busy right now. But if you give me about five minutes, you know. <laughs> he flew to New York and uh, we cut a deal. And uh, I went down to the Jersey Shore. And my son has a house down there. And, and, and I spent the next month rewriting the script. And we called it, My Name is Bill W. And that's how my name is Bill W. You got made. Because they had a contract with the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And so a cook from an alcoholic rehab goes to Hollywood with a script under his arm. <laughs> and I make fun of him. Not realizing that God said, Bill, I'll take over from here. I'll get it done for you. And that's how it got done. It's amazing. It's amazing. Just two last things before I close. Um, I had all these tapes made with Lois, and, and by the way, you know, I don't have to say it in words, but none of this could have happened if I were not sober. None of this could not have, could have happened had I not done what my sponsor said and turned my will and my life over to the care of God and come to realize that all God wants from me is to be a useful tool for him to do what he wants. And my sponsor said, that's why we all come to Alcoholics Anonymous. We think we come for a lot of other reasons, you know, to get the home so-and-so off my back, to be a better husband, a better wife, a better provider, a better worker, a better listener. God brings us here for only one reason, to get sober so we can help someone else. It's as simple as that. And it took me a long time to understand that. Once I understood that, then I understood how my name is Bill W. was made. I had all these uh, tapes with Lois, and uh, we moved to uh, uh, South Carolina. And I was opening them up in my new office, and I put one in 
the machine, and out came Lois's voice, and my wife came running into the office screaming. She said, that's Lois. And I said, yeah, it is. He said, uh, what are you going to do with those tapes? I said, I don't know. She says, you know what you're going to do with them. I said, yes. So I sat down and I wrote a book. I wrote a book called When Love Is Not Enough, because Lois used to always say to us, I always thought my love would be enough to keep him sober, but it was never enough. And, uh, and then uh, my dear friend up at Hallmark uh, got a copy of the book and he called me up and he said, uh, why didn't you tell me about this? I said, I, I wouldn't get around to it. And he said, you believe light, you can strike in the same place twice. I said, if you say so, his name is Brad Moore, president of Hallmark Hall of Fame. I said, if you say so, Brad, he says, yeah, I want to buy the rights to it. So he bought the rights and we made a movie with Winona Ryder and Barry Pepper called When Two Loves, When uh, Love Is Not Enough. And um, another one of those unbelievable privileges that uh, God has brought to me in my life. And to let you know why I understand that all this has happened to me, partially anyway, is because of my mother-in-law, who I came to hate with a passion and then came to love as much as anybody I ever have loved because of what I understood she did for me. Because we had moved to Nashville, Tennessee when I had a tough job getting tough time getting a job in New York. And we were down there, we were having our fifth child. By the way, we, we, uh, we wound up, I, we had four when I was drinking and we had five when I got sober. Of course, a lot of things begin to work again when you get sober, you know, so. Uh, and um, so today we got nine kids, six boys, three girls, and 24 grandkids. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's the progress of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, and a little blue pill. Anyway, that's uh, not, not uh, <laughs> We were having our fifth child in Nashville, and, uh, and Bernadette was really, you know, sweating it out. And I said, I'm going to ask Mama to come down and help. So I went back to New York, and I flew Mama. And Mama had never flown before, never. She was about 68, 69 years old at the time. And, Lovely, beautiful Italian lady. And uh, I never will forget, we were about to taxi, we were taxiing down the runway in, in Kennedy Airport. And she takes out a rosary beads and she starts saying the rosary beads. I said, Mom, if you're praying for yourself, don't worry, you're going to go up. But if this prayer goes down, I'm going with it. And she looked at me and she patted my hand and she said, Not anymore. Not anymore. And we get down to Nashville, down to Nashville and uh, a couple of days later, and, uh, um, she tucks the bomb burner, that, and the kid's in the bed, and whatnot. And, and I'm in the den doing some writing. And, and she passes by, and she sees me, and she's, got, she's heading for the dining room with all of her paraphernalia. You know, she's got her prayer cards and books and rosy beads and whatnot. She sees me in the den, and, and she walks in, and she sits down next to me. And Mama was only about five foot tall. And so she puts her stuff down, and she turns, and she looks up at me, and she says, you know, Bill, she says, all of my life, you know, I've read the New Testament, and I've read about all the miracles that Jesus can performed, you know. And then I open up the lives of the saints, and I read about all the miracles that the saints performed. And she said, I've often wondered what it would be like to see a real miracle. And then she put her hand on my shoulder, and she said, and now I have. She saw the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous in my life. And I'm be, I'll be forever grateful for that. And thank you for letting me share that. My name's Ron, I'm an alcoholic. And, you know, I, I send out a text every once in a while. It says, you know, um, God loves me best. And, uh, and, and then underneath it says, and, and so does you, he does to you. And that's the way I feel with Alcoholics Anonymous. What a, what a deal we've gotten here. And uh, our speaker, I mean, most of the speakers travel far to get here. I mean, sometimes it's seven hours. And if we can't afford them a couple of extra minutes on the podium, and, I, and take it out on me. But uh, I feel blessed tonight to have this. We have a nice way of closing. See you again next week. Steph Jay is coming up from Delaware. Thank you. The recording you've just listened to 
was recorded on October 24, 2015 in Doylestown, Pennsylvania at the Conscious Contact Speaker Group. You can Google our website, AA Doylestown Saturday Night, one-hour speaker meeting, Conscious Contact Speaker Group. See you next Saturday.